Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. It's, it's a great pleasure to welcome you here today and, and for many of you to welcome you back. Uh, it's an honor and a privilege for me to be here to celebrate the life of our dear friend, Catherine Wasserman Davis. Let me first welcome and recognize the members of the Davis family who have joined us today on the one year anniversary of Catherine's passing. Thank you, thank you for allowing Wellesley to celebrate and honor Catherine on this special occasion. It is also wonderful to see so mem many members of the Wellesley community here in the chapel this afternoon and to know that others are joining us by live stream. Your presence, all of your presence, is a testament to the lasting impression that Catherine has had and continues to have on this campus. Certainly, Catherine's effect at Wellesley can be seen in many ways, not the least of which is through the Davis Museum and Cultural Center, or through the many pursuits in which she believed. Here at Wellesley, those pursuits included her support of financial aid for students, global education initiatives, professorships in Asian studies and Slavic studies, and helping restore the campus landscape. And I'm happy to report just moments ago, we held a small ceremony for the Davis family to dedicate a swing that now bears Catherine's name just outside the chapel. And I urge all of you to take a swing before you leave. She often said that swinging on the chapel lawn was one of her favorite Wellesley memories. We are very grateful to Catherine for her vision, for her generosity, and for her lifelong dedication to Wellesley. That dedication that lasted nearly 85 years. It is also important to note that Catherine's impact at Wellesley ex extends far beyond the physical spaces on campus that bear her name. She approached life with an eye to living each day to its fullest. She had an insatiable appetite for lifelong learning. She remained always open to new ideas and to meeting new people. She was determined to always do her small part to make the world a better place. These values she espoused, these values she lived, are what we at Wellesley continue to aspire to every day. Catherine did make the world a better place, and she made Wellesley a better place. This afternoon, through the stories we tell and the memories we share, I hope you will see how Catherine Wasserman Davis, proud member of the Red Class of 1928, very much continues to be a living presence and an important figure in our community. Now, it's my pleasure to call on Paulina Ponce de Leon Berrido, uh, Rutendo Gambe, and Annie Smith, all of whom have benefited from the generosity of the Davis family and who will say a few words. Thank you. I am sitting next to Mrs. Davis, listening very, very closely to all of the stories that she's sharing with us. The setting is a dinner for UWC Davis scholars and the Davis family. And this was the first time that many of us were meet meeting Catherine. She speaks so softly that my friends and I need to lean in towards her, creating a little imaginary bubble around us. Time seems to slow down. She keeps talking about her recent trip to Russia, all of the places that she visited, all of the people that she talked with, the food. In front of me is this tiny, super huggable woman who seems to have more energy than all of us combined. And she's so kind and so gentle, so curious and concerned about the world. 
and her mind is sharp, and her soul adventurous. I want to be like her when I grow up. We all do. That night, as a token of my appreciation towards her and her family, I gave her a very small gift from Mexico, which is where I'm from. It was a wooden box carved and colored by hand, and inside was a rebozo, which is like a Mexican pashmina. I just wanted to say thank you. But weeks later, to my surprise, I received a handwritten note from Catherine. She thanked me for the gift, said she thought it was lovely, and described where in her house she had put it for others to see. So wealthy of her, I thought. But my gift was tiny compared to the gift that she and her family gave my classmates and I. This college and this community are some of the greatest gifts that I've ever received. Wellesley and its women are a constant source of energy and inspiration. They are my scream tunnel when the journey gets rough, and they are my partners in crime when dancing and laughing and celebrating each other is in order. And this campus, which Catherine so loved and supported with its curved paths and the hidden corners, the protecting trees and the peaceful lake, this campus is home. Wellesley opened the door to many dreams. Here, I began to understand how different disciplines can build in, on each other. I was very interested in science and development, and Wellesley, Wellesley helped me learn how to think about how you can bring two of those disciplines together to create something bigger than each of those can do on their own. And this led to a Watson Fellowship, which was an incredible journey, and it brought me face to face with a lot of the issues that Catherine cared about it became so obvious that there's so much more that we have to do to fight poverty to, and to ensure better access to health and education and a lot of basic services, to foster peace and international understanding, all causes that Catherine Davis was very much involved in. I wouldn't be who I am today if it wasn't for Wellesley. And I wouldn't have been able to study here without the generosity of Mr. Shelby Davis, Catherine's son. And I'm sure that Catherine helped shape that generosity. And Wellesley certainly wouldn't be what it is today if it wasn't for the footprints that Catherine has left behind here and there. I hope that her footprints stay, and I hope that her example keeps whispering, whispering to us, stay curious, be grateful, and give. Attending Wellesley after my UWC experience felt like finding the perfect complement, the natural next step, with both experiences instilling in me lifelong values. I gained the independence to think, to challenge ideas, and to challenge myself through it all. The importance of being open to new thoughts and ideas and simply not accepting perspectives as they were presented to me was made very clear. For me, the Albright Institute was as an example of these lessons in action. It brought together students from a wide range of cultures and academic interests and gave us the opportunity to address global issues from all our different lenses. During this time, I worked on a project to address the funds necessary to tackle HIV AIDS, cholera, malaria, and TB. It was through this that I appreciated the importance of having different viewpoints address one problem. In the midst of all the business and intellectual stimulation, Wellesley too provided a beautiful and quiet space to build friendships in some of the most unexpected ways. The greenhouses are one of those special places for me. In addition to the warmth, I really enjoyed the stillness of the rooms and their personalities. The tropical room being everything science related, while the water plants were part of most of my women's and gender studies readings. Spending so much time, they even made way for tasting bananas in the tropical room. 
This was all made possible through Catherine's commitment to maintaining Wellesley's beautiful landscape and making sure that we did have these spaces for quiet. Being a member of Colors Music also built friendships through sharing culture through song. I remember how honored we felt when we sang Happy Birthday, Kenyan style, for her 103rd birthday. It took us all a few moments to collect ourselves before we could actually perform. It was all because we knew of her legacy and how she had impacted each one of us that made singing for her extra special. I know her lessons are with me that even after graduation, the first thing that I looked to do was volunteer. There are many ways that Katherine Davis influenced my life, the most obvious example being the 100 Projects for Peace program, which allowed me to work on the rehabilitation of flood-devastated farms in the indigenous northern regions of Panama. The connections forged during that summer and the type of work pursued shaped my studies and activities for good, bleeding into my current career path and the choices made along the way that led me to where I am now. Be it the 100 Projects for Peace program, an internship in East Africa, or a volunteer position at the Natick Community Organic Farm, where I would spend time between classes gardening, caring for livestock, and interacting with the wider community from the Boston area, I continue to draw on lessons gleaned from experiences during my Wellesley days. These opportunities made possible through the extraordinary financial and non-material support offered to Wellesley students were welcome outlets and nurtured my continued interest in agriculture and development. This broad range of offerings galvanized my time at Wellesley and at the United World College of Southeast Asia beforehand as a time of infinite possibility. Though I'm sure some of this may have come from the general youthful energy, zest, gusto, and joie de vivre experienced by all in their college and high school days, I'm positive that my sense of infinite options was made all the stronger by the nurturing environment and willingness to, time and time again, jump on board with the undertakings and ideas of a cohort of 16 to 23 year olds, characteristic of the UWC movement, Wellesley College, and perhaps most of all, the Davis family. The support of the Davis family has been a key ingredient to my self-actualization, both in the professional and personal arena. I cannot overstate the enormous influence my time at UWC and Wellesley College, in addition to the 100 Projects for Peace program, have had on my development, not to mention how much these extraordinary experiences have enriched my life. None would have, been, one, none would have crossed my path had it not been for the Davis family. We are tremendously grateful for the gift of Katherine Davis's life and the possibilities she has brought to me and so many others. The enormous faith that she and the Davis family places in younger generations is courageous, generous, and exemplary. We hope to do you proud.
We are so happy to be gathered here to get, to, uh, today with the wonderful friends and family of Catherine Davis. And uh, I'm Lulu Wong, a trustee emerita. And I'm so honored to be here to moderate um, a conversation and remembrances for Catherine among our three presidents. Um, Nan Cohane, as you all know, was our 11th president and served as President Wealthy from 81 to 93, and otherwise known as the Sports Center. <laughs> uh, Diana Walsh was our 12th president, served from 93 to 07, and otherwise known as the Alumni Hall Center. <laughs> and then now we have Kim Bottomley, who's our 13th president since 2007, and uh, and I guess your purview is the entire campus. <laughs> Anything's fair game. Right. <laughs> we wanted to, to gather together to share some stories and happy memories of Catherine. And um, the, the, um, the planners of this celebration were thinking, what are the things that come to mind when one thinks of Catherine? And when we think about her beloved Wellesley. And it seemed in many ways Catherine um, was the quintessential Wellesley woman. And in many ways, she captured, as well as influenced, the, the qualities that we so value here. And as we were thinking about what constitutes a quintessential Wellesley woman, a QWW, uh, <coughs> three, three attributes really came to mind. The first was just the incredible curiosity, a, a joyous openness to experience the wide, wide world, and, and in this wide, wide world to make a difference. Secondly, was to have a passion for Wellesley, for the institution, but for everyone in the community. And that community ranged from the students, to the faculty, to the alums, and to everyone here who loved and, and worked for this wonderful institution, from the leadership to the newest groundsman. Uh, everywhere Catherine went, she had great interest in all the people in the Wellesley community. And then finally, um, a, long, uh, a dedication to life's uh, uh, long learning. This is something that uh, Catherine evidenced in, in many, many ways. And a, a um, dedication that was not only to enhance one's own understanding of the world, but also to be able to be of service to the world. Because she truly believed in Wellesley's model to not be ministered onto, but to minister. And so with these thoughts about what, the, uh, what makes up the quintessential Wellesley woman, I thought I might ask our presidents who are gathered here today to reflect a bit about how Catherine um, um, really embodied these attributes and perhaps to weave into their, their recollections how they first met her. So um, perhaps I might start with Nan. We'll begin chronologically. So Nan, perhaps you could share with us some, some special stories of Catherine. Thank you, Lulu. It's wonderful to be here back in this marvelous space with so many good friends, and especially together to be honoring this quintessential Wellesley woman, which she surely was. And all of us feel lucky to have known her. So how did I first meet her? Well, when I came back to Wellesley in the summer of 1981, Catherine had already invited me to visit her in Northeast Harbor later in the summer. And I looked forward to that, but with some trepidation, because here I was for the first time to be meeting a legendary Wellesley woman, someone I'd heard about for a long time, and I was quite new to this presidenting business, and I wasn't at all sure how that would feel. Well, I shouldn't have worried. Catherine was, of course, unfailingly gracious, warm, and welcoming. And it was such a lovely, restful place with gorgeous views in both, both, views over, uh, both directions over Mount Desert. And I felt more comfortable than I could possibly have imagined. And in that setting, she surely embodied the Wellesley motto. She did not expect me to minister to her as the new president. She was ministering to me as a wonderful hostess, a wonderful alumna, and already a good friend. Her family, several of whom are sitting here, took us on wonderful hikes 
and the conversations at dinner were lively and memorable with guests that she knew, both famous and just plain interesting, from around Mount Desert. And that was a wonderful summer. And it became a cornerstone for Bob and me of a place we loved and came back to at Catherine's invitation every year. And after I retired as president, we in fact built a little house of our own on an island off Mount Desert where we looked back at Catherine's Ridge and always thinking about our time with her and regularly then had dinner with her. And we also enjoyed dinners with Catherine in Tarrytown, lunches at the Cos Club, weekends in Florida, and in each setting, her curiosity about the world, her dedication to lifelong learning, her open-mindedness, and her gracious friendship were very much in evidence. Just two more conversations I want to report. A crucial set of conversations in the mid-1980s led to the decision to build the Davis Museum. Catherine cared a lot about art. She became, in fact, a very good painter in her 80s and 90s. But she cared most about global issues and about Wellesley in the wide, wide world. And we worked together to see how these things might fit. And Catherine was the one who came up with the idea, the winning formula. Art is the most truly global language. And so together, with the strong support of Catherine and her husband, Shelby, we built the Davis Museum. And that time together led to my respect and affection for her deepening every year. My last conversation with Catherine was in some ways the most memorable of all, and several of you have heard this story. The summer before she died, when she was 105, she and Shelby and Gail and Cindy came out to our island in a water taxi. Um, having, helping Catherine off the water taxi was a bit of a project, but there were many of us there to do it. Her body was fragile, but her mind, as you've said, was as sharp as ever. And we had dinner inside the restaurant, found a quiet corner so that we could talk. I had to lean in, as you've said, to create a little bubble so that we could have a conversation. And it was evident that her mental capacity was as rich as ever. At one point, recalling that Bob, my husband, had always said that Catherine was the last person you should ever follow on a podium she was the best speaker that he knew. I said to Catherine, and also what a wonderful intellectual she was, I leaned in and said to her, Catherine, you've had a great life, but if you'd chosen a different path, you could have been a wonderful professor at a college like Wellesley. And Catherine said very quietly but very clearly, it's never too late. <laughs> Thank you so much, Nan. Those are wonderful stories we won't ever forget. Um, and Diana, may I pass it on to you now? Sure. <clears throat> Thank you, Nan. Wonderful to hear your story. So many of my experiences were similar to yours. It's wonderful to be here, Kim, with you and Nan and Zalulu. <laughs> Zalulu is here with us. Um, so I'm taking a little bit of a liberty with Lulu's question. I actually warned her that I would. <clears throat> and instead of recalling when I first met her, I want to talk about when I first heard about Catherine, when she first entered my life. And from then on, she was very central to my life and continued to be even after I left. And I could talk about her for hours, so it's a very good thing we have the Lulu here keeping time. She may have to get the hook. But the story of when I first heard about Catherine speaks to our, this theme of ours, the quintessential Wellesley woman, the QWW. <clears throat> which is why I want to begin there. Gail Clapper, Clapper and Luella Goldberg, the incoming and outgoing board chairs at the time, were briefing me for a dinner at which I was to be introduced to the trustees who hadn't yet met me as their leading candidate for the presidency before the official vote. They wanted me to make a good impression. <laughs> they were out on a limb. And so Gail gave me a tip. We have two senior trustees, she said, they are both fabulous. They have the same last name. Don't mix them up. <laughs> they are very different. <laughs> and they were. Elizabeth Kaiser Davis was elegant, tall, and understated, introverted, and famously frugal. 
The first time I visited her for tea at her Florida home with her Wellesley daughter, just the three of us, Lib passed a plate of plain cookies, to which her daughter said, Mom, it's the Wellesley president. Don't you think we should give her a napkin? <laughs> <laughs> Unfazed, Lib reached for the Kleenex box. <laughs> She extracted one tissue, she tore it into three. <laughs> I kid you not. <laughs> and with the dignity I came to treasure in her, gave us each one piece. I'll always cherish that moment and so many others in the company of the gracious and generous Lib Davis, who was admired and loved by all. And then there was Catherine Wasserman, Davis, admired and beloved too, as we all know so very well with her wonderful family here. She was tiny and lively, a sparkling conversationalist, famously social. To have tea with Catherine was to enter a globally connected intellectual salon, symbolized by the gold ambassador's pin she often wore on the lapel of a wool-knit designer suit as she offered savory treats, and many of them, to world leaders, philanthropists, public intellectuals, academics from near and far. There was never any danger I would mix them up. <laughs> and I'm not doing that now. Don't worry, Luella. I dearly love them both. And what I like about this story is the statement it makes about this idea of ours of the QWW, and how capacious that concept has always been, how broad and elastic, and ever the more so, as Catherine and Lib would want to celebrate with us. They both lavished time on students and delighted in the variety of the student body as it, as, as it this changing student body, expanded the possibilities for creative new expressions of the essence of Wellesleyness. So now, as we watch the QWW continue to emerge in marvelous new forms and shapes and hues, personalities and predispositions, we can see that she, this iconic Wellesley woman, has long been shape-shifting. If we're lucky, she always will, because much of her beauty lies in her diversity. And it is her flexibility, her ability to adapt to changing times, that holds the evolutionary key to her resilience and her strength and her power. What doesn't change, the constants, are her underlying qualities of intellect, will, and conscience, qualities of mind and qualities of heart. And we can see them as a brilliant rainbow of light, refracted through the long and legendary life of the incomparable Catherine Davis, as we're doing this afternoon. So a couple of lessons from Catherine's life. The Wellesley archives, fortunately, are replete with stories from this remarkable life, including a lengthy oral history that Nikki Tanner, the trustee, conducted in 1988 and 1990. The files are an, an anthology of life lessons for us. One of Catherine's mantras was a piece of advice she told Nikki that she had received from her mother, another QWW, on the day she arrived at college. Keep making friends, her mother told us. And as I look back on that, from the standpoint of Catherine's long life, it seems to me now that much more than just a mother's antidote to the homesickness at that painful moment of parting, although surely it was in part that, some things never change. Beyond that though, these three words were a life philosophy, one with recognizable roots in many of the world's most enduring wisdom traditions. Catherine was always making friends in her far-flung travels she liked to say that while her husband Shelby was meeting foreign dignitaries, she would strike out on her own, connecting with as many ordinary people as she could possibly find. 
Making friends in Catherine's world was something far deeper than it has become in the Facebook era of friending as a verb. It was a process of opening herself to wider and wider circles of strangers, hearing them deeply, taking them in, taking them on, as friends in the I and thou transformations that Martin Buber wrote about. In doing this, Catherine was widening her circles, not only of empathy, but also of conscious and active compassion, looking for and finding ways to relieve the suffering of this one or to foster the flourishing of that one. Through these expanding circles, she was able to inspire and to touch multiple thousands of lives, bringing her message of peace, of caring, of love. Such a lovely, loving person she was. And two, and I want to say this, her message of responsibility for our actions, including our impact during this Earth Week. I saw a line in front of the Lulu saying it's Earth Month including our impact on the sustainability of life on the planet. This is an issue that, if she were here today, she would be encouraging us to take up with the sense of deep purpose and urgency that infused all that Catherine did. She was a realist who read the newspapers every day. She savored the beauties and bounties of the natural world. She admired scientists. She trusted science. She saw far back in the past and farther into the future. She, of all people, would have wanted us to face into the fear that her dream of a world of peace and harmony could turn to dust if we fail to take measures, decisive ones now, to reverse the damage we humans are doing to the life support systems of planet Earth. And she was a practice speaker, as Nan has said, an amazing speaker as Bob said, amusing and persuasive. She would memorize her talks and deliver them without notes, putting some of us to shame. <laughs> she once gently chided me for that. Her most important and bravest talk, I think she would agree, was her last at age 100. Her acceptance speech on receiving the Woodrow Wilson Award for Public Service. In it, she challenged a large audience of movers and shakers to ask themselves why we are always preparing for war, never for peace, and how they were going to change their mindset, as she called it. Today, she might add, why are we humans waging war on the ecosystems that sustain all our lives? And what are we prepared to do to change that mindset? to end that violence. Catherine rehearsed her talks before delivering that. I discovered that when staying with her. I heard her talking in the room next door, and it turned out she was practicing a speech. She sometimes invited feedback from her house guests. If she were advising me on this one, she'd probably forgive me for my notes. She usually did. But I can hear her saying this. Well, you are right, Diana. This is real. It is urgent. I'm glad you're bringing it up. But you've dragged us down. And now you must pick us up. Fear is a paralyzer. Hope motivates. And so I end with a smile occasioned by my husband's favorite memory of times with Catherine. He loved her too. This is a delicious example of her juicy joie de vivre we were in Paris for a campaign event, and Catherine announced that she had secured tickets for the Folie Berger, <laughs> known for those who don't know for the high kicking chorus line. She wanted us to join her. We did. And Chris said later that he'd never have braved this body show had he not been under the protective wing <laughs> of such a formidable force as the intrepid Catherine Davis. It was an enormous privilege to be under Catherine's protective wing. As I always felt I was during my presidency and thereafter, 
and as this college of ours always was to its great benefit. Catherine lived a charmed life in many ways, but it was not without challenge and sorrow. Her long life gave her a unique view of current reality as we're living it now. She knew that never before in the history of our species have we known more about the wonders of life and the universe. And never before have the inhumanities and the privations and the dangers around the world been so present in our daily lives. Catherine had a special ability to stand at that crossroads between suffering and wonder. She never lost her childlike sense of delight, never lost her determination to ease any pain she possibly could. And so it's in her story that we find the hope we need. She taught us that a life of joy is a life of thinking, of learning, of serving. She demonstrated that such a life, such a life lived well, is an irrepressible force for good in the world. She would want us to carry on with courage and with love as she did, and we will. So thank you, Catherine. Thank you so much, Diana. I think as we all sit here, we all feel we are under her wing. And that's a wonderful feeling. Thank you so much. Um, Kim, could we ask you to share some of your recollections? Absolutely. I'd just like to begin by saying it's wonderful always to be here with the other two presidents. Uh, we've done this once before, and it was quite a lot of fun. And so it's good to see you, two of you together and be here for such a great event. Thank you for inviting us. Yes, well, you're welcome. And Lulu, of course, uh, it's just terrific to have you here with us today to take time out of your schedule for such an important thing. And I must say, it's, it's a little bit intimidating following three Wellesley alums uh, in their uh, recitations of Catherine's Wonders, but I'll give it a shot. So I met uh, Catherine when she was 102 years old. And uh, I thought I would just tell you a little bit about uh, my early impressions of her when I first came to the college. I'd heard a lot about her. There was the Catherine Davis lore, so I, I sort of knew what to expect. Uh, but, and also, I will t I'll tell you just a little bit about the last time I saw Catherine. So my first vivid recollection of Catherine was in uh, the May of 2008, and it was during my uh, inauguration dinner. And uh, it had been quite an active day, a very exciting day. And I was having dinner with uh, trustees and others uh, who attended. And I was being celebrated. There were toasts being given, great speeches delivered. Uh, and it was quite an amazing event. Um, and it's somewhere in about 2 thirds of the way through the dinner, Catherine walked up to the podium and gave a marvelous speech. She was just really dazzling. Uh, uh, it was, she was, uh, had these won wonderfully welcoming words. And it was sort of the first time I'd heard her speak. And there was something about the way she speaks. She's so strong when she speaks, but she's so soft when she speaks. Uh, it was witty. It was articulate. It was perfectly structured as a, as a short talk. And I want to mention that because Catherine had a way of speaking like no other person I've ever met. It, some of it's generational, and some of it was just simply Catherine really knew how to use words effectively. And it's something I will always remember about her. She wasn't loud, she didn't have to emphasize things, she just said things in a way that made you sort of sit up and pay attention. She kind of glowed when she, when she spoke. Um, I was very touched by this uh, 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 sort of uh, speech encouraging me in my new presidency. And I thought how smart it was of the in inaugural committee to put Catherine uh, on the agenda um, to be one of the speakers. Um, but it turned out she wasn't a scheduled speaker. <laughs> <laughs> and she surprised me and probably everyone else who had organized the event by just going up, up to the podium and speaking extemporaneously. Now I kind of wonder whether it really was extemporaneous. <laughs> 
But anyway, it was a very special quality and a very special evening. The last time I visited, uh, that last time Catherine visited Wellesley, I had a chance to talk to her, and it was quite a memorable uh, day. It was September 2012, and she was here to celebrate her light, long time friend and colleague, Marshall Goldman. I'm so here, happy you're here today, Marshall. Thank you. Um, and she was there for the whole day, and she was really in fine form. She had things, though, she wanted to tell her president. I suspect she always had things she wanted to tell her president. <laughs> Um, and I rem remember them as sort of three wishes. She wanted to go boating on Lake Waban that day. And she wanted to discuss the large blank outer wall of the Davis Museum, which she felt was just, just didn't look right. And she wanted her swing back. <laughs> so it was a wonderful, you know, fall day, uh, it was uh, just, just couldn't be any nicer at the Wellesley campus. And I'll always recall that image of Catherine, sort of a beautiful woman at the age of 105, happily boating on Lake Waban. You know, and the interesting thing about that is we talked about that all day, and I think I talked about it on campus, and I eventually talked about it with my vice president for finance, and he went, you let Katherine Davis go boating on Lake Waban? <laughs> Sometimes you don't want to talk to the risk management people on your campus before you do these things. Anyway, I would have to say she got her other two wishes as well, as you probably all know now. After she left, the crew team, who also loved Katherine, uh, decided to name the boat she had ridden after her. And we now have in our fleet a boat named Catherine, class of 20, 1928. It's, thank you so much, Kim. Um, every memory is special to us, and thank you for sharing yours. As we listen to um, all these wonderful, loving remembrances, certain things particularly st uh, stay with us. And I think, Nan, we loved your it's not too late story. I mean, that is one of the best stories about Catherine. And I think her comment about not too late is fueled by this incredible innate optimism that she always brought to life. And with everything she touched, she brought that optimism and inspired other people. And um, whether it was her sense that she could always bring out the best in others by being the role model, taking the high road, it was always something that uh, was so impressive. I remember um, having lunch with her maybe two, oh, two, or year, two or three years ago, and she was saying she was really worried about what was going on in North Korea. She was very aware of what was going on around the world, and she thought that the leader was acting very irresponsibly, uh, the nuclear threat was uh, very disturbing to her. So she said, well, I wrote him a note. <laughs> and never doubting that, that it would get through to him. But she said, I wrote him a note. I said, we are both grandparents. We both have a reason to live for the future. So why can't we talk peace? And I don't think she got a response, but she always checked her mail every day. <laughs> she thought she would. And on, on, a, on a more successful um, basis, she envisioned um, Wellesley being truly global. And she knew that it was very important for, not only for our students to be able to travel abroad and have a sense of being global citizens, but she also thought it was very important that um, the very best and brightest young women in the world could come to Wellesley. And she knew that this was a financially daunting uh, proposition. And in her thinking about it and talking to her family and Shelby in particular, this is how the United World Colleges plan began. And through its program and its uh, uh, generosity, we've been able to bring the best and brightest of women around the world to Wellesley. And so in many ways, her optimism, um, when she turned it toward tackling problems, really did have a lasting impact on all of us who knew her. She's also very committed to diversity. I think uh, 
she thought by bringing the world to Wellesley, Wellesley would truly become as diverse as it can be, and it truly is now. And I think the richness of our um, student body, as well as our thinking and our cultural influences here, very much reflects Catherine's dream for, for Wellesley. Uh, in many ways, I think all of you have been touched by her optimism and her ability to envision how optimism can make Wellesley and the world a better place. And I wonder if any of you might want to um, share some stories there. I think one aspect of, of Catherine's very distinctive and special quality was that she was a believer both in small-scale, um, private, low-level activities where people just happen to get together casually and make a difference, as in several of the projects that she has sponsored. But she also believed, and this is something that I think for us now is particularly important, she believed in the political life. She believed that change could come through good leaders. And she saw them around the world. She knew them and supported many of them. And although she was not at all naive about the problems with politics, she did believe that leaders can make a difference at any level, from the most low key to the most prominent. And she exemplified leadership in her own life, but she also recognized its importance and helped those of us who knew her and worked with her see why it was important. So <clears throat> I completely agree, Nan, that, that, that <clears throat> sort of understanding politics, politics being political. Um, she, she understood roles, too, and she, she, she had character. She had that quality that we know as character, that kind of clearness and firmness and trustworthiness. And she could also be a character, and she'd do that purposefully. She knew how to use herself as an example and offer herself an example as an example. There was an article in the New York Times right around her 100th birthday. It was a big spread. It was a beautiful article with a wonderful picture of Catherine looking radiant, glowing, <clears throat> with her little teaser in her lap, the little white dog. And um, the reporter, who obviously was very taken with this extraordinary woman, led off the article with a description of Catherine, it was in Tarrytown that this meeting took place, coming down the stairs uh, with her cane. She was carrying the blue and white cane. That she, she had a cane collection, and the reporter wrote about this cane collection, that she seemed to have a cane to go with every outfit. <laughs> and so she came down with this cane, kind of going tap, tap, tap down the stairs, as the reporter, in this visceral way, wrote that she wielded with great authority, the reporter said. And that, and, and that was Catherine enacting the, the character of the 100-year-old Catherine Davis with a purpose, with a purpose. And one of the messages she was sending was a message about aging gracefully. There were a number of messages she was sending, and it was always writing the note to the president of North Korea. She was, was always incubating something that was important to her. But this message of aging gracefully, we have this wonderful program with the beautiful young Catherine and on the next place page, the beautiful older Catherine, beautiful at all times and seasons of her life. So <clears throat> the optimism continued to run through her life and we saw this woman at 105, 106, who was just extraordinary. The story of the cane, I think, jumped out at me when I was rummaging through my hard drive a day or two ago thinking about this, this conversation because on my last visit with Catherine, I saw her two weeks before she died. It was the most extraordinary visit. I'll never forget it. It was one of the most extraordinary experiences of my life. She was as fully cognizant and lucid as she always had been. She knew all of the grands and all of the great grands, every one of them by name, and went through the inventory. I have one child and one grandchild, and I have to work to keep up with them. <laughs> <laughs> we did our exchange of all that. But I had arrived with a, <clears throat> with a broken foot. I'd been on a trip, and I'd broken my foot in Hong Kong, and I had a big, ugly boot on my foot. 
And she insisted that I take one of her canes, that I have, that I have one of her canes. She gave it to me as a gift, selected one. I don't know which of her costumes it matched. <laughs> I don't know which of my costumes it will match someday. But if someday I can wield that cane with the grace and the generosity and the character and the authority that Catherine wielded with her cane, I will be a lucky person. So it, it, it reminds me that Catherine did really want to live her life to the fullest. At every, every moment I ever saw her, she was always thinking of the next things she would think about or do, or testing out ideas. And it just reminded me of uh, just a small story that, uh, that happened once I went once uh, I visited her, went to her home for dinner. And she told me that she had invited another scientist to be at this dinner as well. Uh, so I would have somebody to talk to. <laughs> and, 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 and she hoped I didn't mind. And I thought that was quite interesting. But it turned out the other scientist was Jim Watson. The, <laughs> for those of you who know, the Jim Watson of Watson and Crick, a structure of DNA. And of course, I didn't mind that at all. But. Well, <laughs> But what was really interesting about this is I realized sort of as the conversation was proceeding, and Jim is a pretty provocative guy, and my competitive juices got going as a fellow scientist, that Catherine was fully enjoying the kind of argumentative conversations that Jim and I were having at this dinner table and at sitting and waiting. And this is what she liked to do. She liked to learn this way. She wanted to hear more about what the theories were about, how scientists talked to each other. She was, she was instinctively interested in science, although she always talked about how she didn't like science at Wellesley because they made her draw amoeba and she couldn't do that very well. But, but she always wanted to live life to the fullest extent and be part of what was exciting and new in the world. And, I really appreciated that about her. I was just listening to all three of you, and all of you uh, used the word grace to describe Catherine. And in a way, that word describes her so much better than another word that's often applied to Catherine, and that's generous. Because many people can be generous, but not everyone has grace. And uh, grace is really um, it's a fundamental quality of um, conscience, compassion, and, and will, and Catherine had that in spades. And she had this uncanny awareness of other people's needs. Never thought of her own needs, but of other people's needs. And then the sense of responsibility to make it better, to help. And this was what made her so impactful. She not only felt people's needs, but she wanted and she did help. And I think one um, recollection I have about that is, um, um, in the last capital campaign, the one that Diana <laughs> oversaw, we were looking at the needs of the, uh, the college. And at that time, we had just done a master plan of the campus. And one of the woeful uh, observations was that this beautiful campus was being messed up by all the cars because the seniors had their cars and they parked them wherever they wanted to and they were in the meadows and making muddy ruts in the, uh, among the wildflowers and it really just was not allowing the beautiful campus to be shown at its best or to be um, conserved. And so the decision was that we needed to have a, a basically a parking lot, a parking facility, which is not a glamorous um, thing to do, but Catherine saw the need that her beloved Wellesley needed and she, she stepped forward and said, I will help to build this parking facility. And we all tried to think of a fancier name to give it. <laughs> it just didn't seem like parking lot, parking facility. But Catherine was fine. She said, this is what Wellesley needs, and I would like to help. And this is just her way of always sensing the need and then finding her own way to help. And I think in all of your presidencies, as you, as you work with her, I'm sure there are ways in which, without your even asking her, she sends a way that she could help Wellesley, help you. And I wonder if there are any, any stories there you might want to share with us. I guess what I'm moved to share by your question is actually something a bit tangential, but she really did love Wellesley. It came through so much in her life, in her conversation, in her priorities. I remember her being a steady presence at reunions. 
And to me, when I think about Wellesley reunions, I always think about how wonderful it is to, be, to see the succession of Wellesley women across the years. As we walk past, you can sort of feel the different stages of a woman's life in a way that I've never seen it elsewhere. I'm sure all of you who've been to reunion know exactly what I mean. And when I thought about reunions, every time from, my, from the time I became president until I went to my last reunion with her class, she was so much there, and her, her vivid spirit, and the fact that she always walked, and I somehow believe that if she'd been able to come back for her last reunion that she narrowly missed, um, she would have still walked somehow with a cane, being Catherine, for at least part of the time. And that, to me, was a, a, a vivid embodiment of the Wellesley woman across the decades. And in that way, the quintessential Wellesley woman works perfectly for me. Yes, it's true. And she, she was a wonderful member of the Board of Trustees and a very active one, very active one in your presidency and, and through most of mine. <laughs> when, when we would, every year, of course, the tuition, we'd have to set the tuition again, and every year it went up because we were looking at all these. One year you didn't raise the tuition at all. That was very brave, but then the next year, <laughs> the next year we had to raise it even more to catch up. <laughs> one of those things. This funny little competition between all these schools. And every year, you know, there'd be some thoughtful argument and formula and all of that. And Catherine, when it was all done and the vote was taken and it was no, one, no uncertainty left, she'd say, well, now I just need to say that I don't think we should allow these tuitions to go up every year. It's not fair to the students. They have to work so hard and we just should and I thought, you know, we should get her to the conference of presidents, all of them, <laughs> from all the college and universities all over the country, and maybe she could have gotten all of us to agree to a tuition detente. But I want to, <clears throat> I want to tell, you talked about needs, and I, I want to tell a little personal story for my, my last crack. I think we're running out of time. Um, so... <clears throat> At that last uh, meeting I, that I had with her two weeks, roughly two weeks before she died, I, I came in, um, I forget the day of the week, but I came in sort of midday one day, spent the night and had the, the half the next day. We had an amazing, amazing time. We talked about everything and, and you know, all of her wonderful family that she just loved so dearly. And um, <clears throat> been back and forth and all the things we shared. And at one point, and then it was my turn to tell about my little itty bitty family, and so I caught her up on that, and she tracked all of that. And then she said, "This is what, what blew me away." She said, <clears throat> "I'm sorry, my voice." She said, "Do you remember that time that you and Chris drove up to Maine? Chris was my husband, is my husband, my beloved husband. He still is. Uh, you drove up to Maine, and..." Um, and Chris was president of Dana-Farber then, and he'd had that terrible tragedy. The woman had died tragically, and he was so burdened by it, <clears throat> and he went off and played golf alone, and I was just heartsick for Chris. This was 106 years old, two weeks before she died. This had happened 10, 11, 12 years earlier. And we had been there, Chris and I had been there for the weekend to visit Catherine, and we had been very careful not to talk about this. I didn't even think she knew that something was going on in Chris's life. We didn't, but she knew because she cared, because she had this sixth sense for where people were and what their needs were. <clears throat> and um, and she's, we talked about it. We left that weekend with Catherine and feeling renewed, we had driven up and we drove home, Chris and I. And on the way home, he had been managing this situation for a year and it had been just eating him alive. On the way home, he realized he had to resign from Dana-Farber, that this was the moment for him to step out and say goodbye and move on. And I think in retrospect, when she told me that story, as we sat together, in Hope Sound at the end. I think it was her caring hold without saying a word that she offered Chris and me in that very difficult time in our lives <clears throat> that enabled him to see 
that he needed to go and to act on it. We drove home, he went straight to the telephone in the president's house and set the wheels in motion. So that was the kind of person that Catherine Davis was, the kind of friend, really remarkable, remarkable human being. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you for sharing that, Diana. So just one last uh, reflection from me. Um, one of the things I really liked about Catherine was that she was always interested in the students at Wellesley College. Um, she always talked about them. Um, she always wondered what they were doing, uh, wanted to know more information about them. And just one small anecdote, uh, I, I just, which just represents many things like this that she did, but you know, she spent many years traveling to Russia and uh, she had collected quite a number of photos uh, during those trips. Uh, they meant a lot to her, and she wanted to be sure they could be digitized and archived. And so she um, called Wellesley and said, you know, could we uh, put her in touch with uh, a current senior, a, a Russian major, uh, to help her do this? And of course, we did that. Um, and as a part of that project, uh, the student was invited to have lunch with Catherine uh, at her home in New York. Uh, and at that time, uh, Catherine, of course, in her very thoughtful way, didn't just have lunch with a student, but it invited um, the head of the Global East-West Institute to also be at the lunch. <laughs> These lunches and dinners with Catherine are quite amazing. Uh, and as a result of that conversation, this student was subsequently offered a paid internship in Moscow the following summer. You know, and that's the kind of thing that she, she just thought about things like that and connected people in that wonderful way. You know, the projects for peace, the swing, you know, it, she, didn't, she wasn't, well, maybe I'm wrong, she wasn't planning to swing on the swing. <laughs> she might, she might well, she might, I might be wrong. You know, now that I was saying it, I realized I might be wrong. But she really wanted students to be able to swing on that swing and enjoy it as much as she had enjoyed it when she was a student. Thank you so much, Kim. It's, really been such an honor to be here to celebrate Catherine. And um, I just have, I'd like to close with just one remembrance of my own that I guess I was with Catherine maybe about three weeks before um, she passed. And even then, she was still speaking in her uh, gentle, frail voice about her re reunion coming up. This is, she was determined she was going to make reunion. And that was just a few months, uh, weeks away. And of course, um, we all knew it would, would not be possible. But we talked about it, and she was saying maybe David Rockefeller would bring his car out and drive her. And she was still really full of hope. And it was only at the end, as uh, I was saying goodbye, and um, she said, well, I will be there. And if not, and she didn't say this, but I knew that if not in body, but in spirit. And in many ways, I do feel that she's here with all of us today. And um, she would be smiling on us. Um, rain or shine, she would be smiling on us. And I think we can all go forth from here with great inspiration and a lasting vision of Catherine. So we, we thank you all for being with us today. And uh, we will keep Catherine in our hearts forever. Thank you.
just uh, thank you all for coming today. And um, I invite all the students here to go and take a swing on Catherine's um, swing. It has her name inscribed in it. And there are red ribbons, her class color, adorning the, uh, the chain. And then afterwards, hope you will all enjoy a cupcake at the kick-ass cupcake food truck outside. <laughs> <laughs> and we wish the class of 2014 great luck and good fortune, and especially in completing the 50 things they need to do before they leave uh, Wellesley. After this, uh, all guests are invited to join us on the Severn Screen walkway to see the uh, Wellesley Blue Crew uh, team form a Wellesley salute for Catherine. Um, we now uh, bid you all adieu. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.